hour. So hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Tobin, and I serve as a deputy of the Natural Hazards Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the monthly Making Mitigation Work webinar series, series which is hosted by the Natural Hazards Center and made possible with the support from the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the National Science Foundation. This webinar series, which was launched in 2019, highlights recent progress in mitigation policy, practice, and research. Just a few announcements before we begin the formal webinar presentation. Uh, this forum is being recorded. The captioned video recording and presentation slides from today's webinar will be posted online at the Natural Hazards Center at hazards.colorado.edu. This is also where you can find the recordings and supplemental materials from the prior Making Mitigation Work webinars, as well as access to many other free resources. So please do go check those out after our meeting today. In just a few moments, I'll turn it over to our speaker, but if at any point during the presentation you have questions or comments, please do submit those using the chat function or the Q&A box. I will monitor the questions in both places and return to them during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And thanks to a partnership with the International Association of Emergency Managers, attending this webinar makes you eligible to receive one contact hour of emergency management training through IAEM. However, in order to receive the full credit, you are required to attend the entire webinar session today. And if you fulfill this requirement, you can then please email Katie Murphy at haztr at colorado.edu to request your certificate. You can also visit the Making Mitigation Work webpage under the trainings tab at hazards.colorado.edu for more information. So now I am so honored to get to introduce today's webinar topic and our esteemed speaker. The title of today's webinar is The Lessons of Catastrophe, Structural Challenges and New Disaster Perspectives. Today, we'll be hearing from Michelle Bruno, who will be discussing his book, The Blessings of Disaster, The Lessons That Catastrophes Teach Us and Why Our Future Depends on It. In this book, Dr. Bruno draws from his decades of experience to examine the major environmental and social challenges we face today. He argues that by observing how we currently cope with and react to disasters, we can better predict future successes and failures. And drawing from multiple disciplines and case studies of major disasters, Michelle shows us how we can think in new and better ways about how we mitigate the devastating consequences of these events. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Bruno to today's Making Mitigation Work webinar. Michelle is a distinguished professor at the State University of New York at Buffalo. He is also Emeritus Director of a National Science Foundation's National Engineering Research Center focused on preventing disasters from extreme events. He has worked for more than three decades as part of multidisciplinary teams advancing the goal of disaster resilience and has received more than 20 prestigious awards for his innovative work, including a Lifetime Achievement Award. His extensive body of research has been instrumental to innovative structural system specifications being implemented worldwide. Now, I'm so excited to turn it over to Michelle to begin the conversation, but as a reminder to the audience, please do drop your questions and comments in the chat or Q&A boxes, um, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my slides now. Michelle, if you wanna go ahead and uh, start sharing yours. Sure, let me do that. And, uh... Confirm that it is in full screen mode on your side. Looks wonderful. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the blessings of disaster. Uh, it, uh, to start, when we talk about disasters to a lot of folks, they think that a disaster for them is their favorite team losing in the playoffs. And that's where it stops usually. Well, uh, of course, what we're talking about here is massive, large scale disasters that create tremendous amount of hardship and losses, uh, not this kind of disaster shown on the screen here. So uh, in the blessings of disaster, what's important is not so much the title as the subtitle, because it is the lessons from past disasters that are important. And what is mentioned and proposed in the book is that our response to existential threats depends on whether we learn from or ignore these lessons. So in a sense, what we're trying to answer today is the question, are we doomed? And without any hesitation, the answer is an absolute confident and unwavering, it depends. And uh, let me illustrate why it depends. Using the three little pigs story that uh, some of you may know, some probably don't, so I'll summarize it as follows. There were three little pigs that had to build a home. The first two built it out of straw and out of sticks. 
And that was quite expedient and expensive, left them with lots of time and money uh, specifically to enjoy life, but also to laugh at the third little pig who spent a lot of efforts, money, and time to build a house made out of steel. Now, of course, that is the structural engineering upgraded version of the story. Um, then after that, there's a big bad wolf that shows off and huffs and puffs and blows away the first two homes. And what happens there depends on the version of the story that you know. And the one I'm familiar with, uh, the, third, the first two little pigs become a pulled pork sandwich for the wolf, and that's not a good outcome. Now, when I give this presentation live, I ask people, which little pig do you wish to be? And the near majority raise their hand for the third little pig. Very few people wish to end up in a pulled pork sandwich for a wolf. Now, if I ask the question differently and say, which little pig do you wish to be? if no big bad wolf ever comes. And not just because I say it, let's argue that, let's say that the entire scientific community has established that at that location, there is no such thing as a big bad wolf. Then the scale tips towards the first two uh, little pigs. Some people say, hey, I'll use the money and time to do something else then. If I put the question in the same terms as a building code, say, and say, which little pig do you wish to be? If there's a 2% chance in 50 years as a big bad wolf will come, it's becoming a split. Nothing is as clear anymore. And so what this means is that at any such point in time, depending on circumstances and timing, uh, everybody can be any one of the three little pigs. And this is what makes preventing disasters an uphill battle. And that's the idea or one of the ideas at the core of the blessings of disaster. Now, uh, I also wrote another book, which is uh, for structural steel design. It's 900 pages long and it takes 90 hours to go through it. So this book is half the length. And so I made a special request to have 45 hours for this webinar and it was denied. I only have 45 minutes. So we'll make a very short summary of what's covered in it. I will do bits and pieces of the whole story. And the bits and pieces I wanna to touch upon are the fact that we are exposing ourselves to hazards uh, willingly, setting up the stage for major disasters. We know where these hazards will strike. It's not a matter of when, it's only a matter, uh, not a matter of where, it's only a matter of when. Uh, we can only predict these occurrences, though, in probabilistic terms, which is a problem because we do not connect instinctively with probabilistics. And the fact that there are silent heroes that move the needle one nudge at a time, which is great, they progressively create over decades a word that becomes more resilient to disasters. But when a disaster happens, it puts jet engines on the needle, it opens windows of opportunity for immediate changes, it changes the dynamics of everything. So uh, I'm from an earthquake engineering background and earthquake engineering is a journey. It's not only a technical field. And I want to illustrate that with some personal observation going through over a career here. I went for graduate studies to uh, UC Berkeley to become a structural engineer. And I came back out of there an earthquake engineer because that's what everybody was studying research wise at the time. But when I was there, there was a 1985 Mexico City earthquake that struck. And I was fortunate enough to be able to join a team of faculty members and other graduate students to go there and do a reconnaissance visit of the damage. And we spent an awful lot of time and money in the lab to create one specimen and subject it to earthquake simulation and see the outcome of the test. The earthquake reconnaissance visit is important for us because we have the results of thousands of tests done by Mother Nature. We just need to reverse engineer the process and figure out what the specimen was. So it's pretty, pretty rewarding to do that. As I was a student there, I also noticed something. Uh, when you're in the party and see if you say, what business are you in? And you say, I'm an engineer. Uh, there's an interesting reaction that happens. Uh, but when you say, I'm an earthquake engineer, all of a sudden, everybody wants to know if they're going to be safe in an earthquake, if their building are they're going to collapse on them. And it's a topic that seems to be fascinating. The other thing that I noticed as a student is when I told my, my family that I, I was not doing structural engineering, I was doing earthquake engineering, my grandparents said, earthquake, I've been through an earthquake in 1925 in Quebec City and it damaged buildings and all of that. And sure enough, if you go in the literature, you find all that information. And I said, wait a minute, <laughs> I've lived 23 years of my life in Quebec City and nobody told me anything about earthquakes before. And there was one in 1925. And if you go back to the records, you realize that there's been one every 70 years on average. So people forget. It seems to be one of the first thing about, about disasters is we forget about them very fast. After graduation, 
I went to the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, this is one of the famous picture of damage I took there. And many took the same picture at the same site. Uh, but the thing I want to talk about is going there uh, just the day before, uh, the opening statement on the CBC Evening News was, tonight San Francisco is in ruins. I mean, what does a comment like that achieve? I mean, uh, this is a picture I took coming back from a whole week in San Francisco investigating structural damage from the airplane taking off. And I don't think you could tell that San Francisco is in ruins. That's a great overstatement. Another thing we noticed from the Loma Prieta earthquake is what politicians do following disasters. The, the governor, in reaction to the earthquake, saw so much bridge damage, he appointed an inquiry board to tell him why so many bridges collapsed and to recommend what to do with the rest of the bridges in the state. The board wrote a very politically correct statement that is copied here that I will translate as follow. After the 1971 San Fernando earthquake, many bridges fell off their support during that earthquake. The California Department of Transportation started the project to tie these spans to their support. It took 17 years to do that at a cost of $54 million, so only $3 million a year out of a state budget of $50 billion a year. And that was only phase one of a three-phase retrofit program. So what the board uh, told the governor is that, hey, it was not a priority of Caltran to fix bridges for earthquakes at all. They were more interested in relieving traffic congestion than anything else, which is, by the way, a work in progress still 50 years later. So a few years after that, Loma, uh, after the Loma Prieta earthquake, the Northridge earthquake struck. More bridge damage, all, a similar size earthquake, both of them relatively small versus what's expected to happen in California. But still, at the time, it became the most expensive U.S. natural disaster until Hurricane Katrina took the title a few years later. Uh, there's a lot of engineering stuff that, that, that occurred and that, that was sort of new and interesting. But I want to mention here that uh, only 30% of homeowners were insured. And yet the residential losses amounted to $12.5 billion in claims and led to the near collapse of the insurance market in California. Uh, very hard to get earthquake insurance nowadays in California without massive deductibles. And also 11 hospitals were damaged and rendered unusable at the time of the earthquake. One year later to the day the Kobe earthquake struck in Japan. And a lot of interesting technical stuff there as well, but one thing I noticed, I, was, I spent six weeks following the earthquake in Japan there, uh, visiting a colleague at the University of Kyoto, and we were there in the field a lot of time, and we noticed that on Sundays, something odd was happening. There was massive traffic jams on Sundays. This is what we call earthquake tourism. Folks came from all over the place in Japan to witness the extent of damage in Kobe. When I was in Japan, uh, I discovered that I, I like volcanoes. I discovered volcanoes. I thought, that's interesting. Maybe I should have studied volcano or maybe it should be my second career. Uh, my wife thinks it's safer to study earthquakes now. It's all relative, so she prefers I stick to earthquakes. <laughs> but there's other things out there that create disasters, and that was the beginning of it. Now, uh, I've also been to Turkey a couple of times. Uh, the building you see on the left uh, you can see the first floor, the third floor, and the fourth floor. The second floor now is only a few inches tall. Uh, and people ask me, did I? why did I not go to the 19 February 2023 earthquake in Turkey that just happened? It's because I have tons and tons of pictures from 1999 that look exactly the same as the one from 2023 that my friends and colleagues have sent me. Uh, for example, this is a picture I took in Turkey in 1999. And this is a photo on the right that was shared by uh, Ugus Kazachi from the recent earthquake in Turkey. And you'd swear that's almost the same thing. Uh, same, so a deja vu all over again. Now, a lot of the conclusions that were made after the 1999 earthquakes are copied here uh, from a paper we wrote at the time. And, and uh, it still is the case after the 2023 earthquake. But what is shown there is that in red, earthquake resistant design is actually not mandatory in many parts of the world. And what is significant is it's also the case in many parts of the United States. Uh, and the fact, the second point I wanna make here is that ignorance of the seismic threat and poor implementation of seismic codes was a big problem in 1999 and in 2023. And again, it's not so different than what prevents efforts to implement seismic codes in other parts and some parts of the United States. 
Uh, after the Taiwan earthquake in 1999, a good friend told me that instead of chasing earthquake, I, I should probably chase butterflies. It would be a lot less strenuous. And uh, not for that reason, but for, after that earthquake, I decided that I, if I was to go somewhere, I'll come back to that picture later, by the way, but if I was to go to another earthquake after 1999, I would only go to a place where they have a state-of-the-art building code that is truly enforced and that where I would see damage to steel structures because I'm a researcher in structural steel. So that pushed me back to New Zealand 2011. And I'll come back to the picture again a little bit later. Uh, but between 1999 and 2011, a couple of interesting things happened. Of course, there was 9-11 and our research center was in New York State. So we were close to ground zero. And what we uh, observed as we went to the site is that there's a lot of tools that we were using in earthquake engineering that could actually be used to uh, investigate other, dam other, other disasters. And so we produced a whole report series after 9-11. We produced another report series after Hurricane Katrina. And that was sort of the introduction to multi-hazard in some sense. So traveling across disasters, what I started to realize is that there were many similarities on why disasters occur and will continue to occur, why people care or do not care before a disaster happens, uh, what are the factors that are creating limitations to prevent disasters, and the implication across all hazards are significant, and the implication on what is ahead at the same time, which led to the blessings of disaster. So in a nutshell, what is the book about? And the answer is very simple. Uh, sometimes people are not satisfied by this answer, so I have to expand a little bit. Uh, we are facing many existential threats. Climate change is in the news every day, but there are many others. So what can we expect will happen? And so the book proposes that how we currently deal with various hazards and the disasters they create can possibly predict how we will tackle our existential challenges. Uh, unfortunately, how we deal with existential hazard is not as simple as one may think, and it may be useful for everybody to know why that is the case, because a knowledgeable public is a necessary condition to achieve a resilient society. And I put necessary condition in quote because it's the mathematical definition of necessary condition that I'm referring to here. So the book is broken down in three, part, three parts, meet the hazards, meet the little pigs, and meet the future. In Meet the Hazards, uh, go through a list of all the, uh, well, a list of various uh, hazards that exist, not to describe exactly what they are. Uh, of course, we do a little bit of that, but mostly to explain why we expose, how we expose ourselves to these hazards in so many different creative ways. And I'll highlight some of those in a moment. The second part, Meet the Little Pigs, is disasters are us. There's no disasters without us. So it's our actions and inactions that uh, create barriers against preventing future disasters. And uh, there's many explanations on how we can do that. And the third part is meet the future. It's a glimpse of what the future might have in stock if we extrapolate our approach to disasters to predict how some of these existential threats will play out. And we, the focus on the existential threats is on monetary fragility, climate change, overpopulation, uh, nuclear holocaust, all very joyful topics. Now, uh, let's start with Meet the Hazards. So uh, going back again to my years as a graduate student, this was my walk from home to my campus office every day, back and forth. And it took me a, a couple of months to discover that I was crossing the Hayward Falls twice a day. And so, by the way, is the football stadium on campus. The Hayward Fault is one of the most uh, dangerous one in the Bay Area. And um, I started talking about that with my uh, neighbors and the, the student housing there. And uh, they, they, some of them were from California. And they told me, ah, oh, don't worry about earthquakes. There's nothing to them. I've been through all of them. Uh, you, you study something that's useless. And of course, these were comments made by uh, Californians born after the 1906 earthquake that have forgotten about it. And here's San Francisco in ruins now. This is the right time to say that. Now, the nice thing about uh, faults, I guess, is you can map where they are if you know where they are. And there's many ways to find where the faults are in California. There's a couple of, of uh, websites where you can dig out that information. And in yellow here is the intersection of the San Andreas Fault with the San Francisco Peninsula here. And if we zoom on that fault, uh, what we see is that it intersects a residential neighborhood. 
And I've spent a lot of time online going through real estate websites, tax assessors records to find two homes identical to each other, same number of bedrooms, same number of bathrooms, same size of lots, same year of construction, same number of square footage. One that is 15 miles away from the fault and one that is intersected by the fault, they both sell for the same price. So people do not factor that in their purchase at all. In fact, when you hear people say, oh, implementing mitigation measures is too expensive, it's going to make the houses unaffordable or buildings unaffordable. Well, look at the price of homes from 2011 to 2020. It has more than doubled. And this has nothing to do with hazard mitigation. It's just market prices. Now, sitting on the fault is a little bit more problematic than being away from it. Of course, everybody close to the fault will get severe shaking and feel it. But being on the fault comes with what we call fault offset. I mean, part of the uh, continental mass will move north and part will move south and there'll be an offset. So if you build a, a fence on the, across the fault after the earthquake, there will be a visible movement taking place, just such as was observed here following the 1906 earthquake or such as was observed here following the 2010 Darfield earthquake in New Zealand. That road used to be straight. And it intersects the fault, of course, right there. Now, if you have a house built on a fault, uh, maybe your kitchen will move north relative to the rest of the building or the living room. And this is an example of a building in, in New Zealand that uh, the fault only not, did, not, did not only move sideways, but also had a vertical shift. So it lifted the house and dragged it along for 25 feet. Uh, this is the picture I showed you earlier from the Taiwan earthquake. In this case, this is a dam that was constructed uh, on, a, a, uh, on a river where a, cross, uh, a fault was following the river. And so when the vertical offset from the fault movement took place, it essentially sheared the dam vertically. Now, as not only earthquakes in life, there's other disasters that can happen. Some of you may recognize this picture. It's in Italy. It's at the uh, region around the Vesuvius volcano, which is famous, of course, for its multiple eruptions through time. Uh, one of the most famous one is in 79 AD because of this yellow dot that is shown here is Pompeii. And in Pompeii, uh, pretty much everybody was killed when a pyroclastic flow uh, came down the hill at 100 miles an hour, and these are essentially poisonous gases at 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And then after everybody was dead, Pompey was buried in ashes, the city was erased from the face of the earth, and it was re rediscovered only a few hundred years ago as people were digging in, and they found uh, cavities inside the ashes, they pumped, pla they pumped plaster in the cavities, and this is the sculptures that came out of these cavities. Essentially, people in the position, they died when they were essentially poisoned by the gases. Now, this is all interesting history, but Naples is right here, just about the same distance from the volcano, but north. But that's the center of Naples. Uh, everything that is brown, essentially, in that picture is built area. It's a metropolitan area of more, more than 4 million people. Now, uh, volcano spits lava, and just think of a... Of a an analogy with a candle, trying to predict where will the wax flow along the candle is about the same as trying to predict where will the lava flow around the volcano. And you can have multiple drops follow the same path on a candle, and so can you on a volcano. So if we look at a path from the Vesuvius of the lava flows, the latest lava flow in 1944 was here. And you can tell before the red coloring uh, that the vegetation is not is much younger there, by the way. It's easy to see it from a satellite photograph. If you go to the end of that flow, and we can zoom in a little bit here, and I will recolor in red again so you can see where the lava flow stopped, uh, your eye should catch this. There's a building there. And if you zoom in on that building, you can see that it has been constructed after the lava flow occurred because they carved the driveway into the lava. They sort of carved some of the fences there. Uh, they put nice, it's probably a resort. There's large swimming pools, a lot of, lot of uh, chairs. And uh, when I ask people, how many of you would build your home at the end of a lava flow? Very few people raise their hand typically. Um, but it doesn't stop there. As I said, you can have multiple drops of wax flow the same path along the edge of a candle. So can lava. And uh, look at the end of that uh, lava flow there. And if I superpose a map from previous flows, uh, hundreds of years ago, you can see it actually went farther out. And if I zoom out, just take a look at the elbow there where it's uh, on the upper left corner. If I zoom out, the elbow there is still there. 
it flowed out at quite a distance and, and can reach even small villages there. But I want you to focus not on those uh, lava flows here, but on this part of the map, which shows Torre del Greco. Uh, Torre del Greco, let's zoom in on that box, is also a place that saw multiple lava flows go through. And the last one in 1794 is very well documented in multiple books that show which part of the towns were covered by lava when it happened. And you may say, well, these are old books. People will not remember these because these nice images of lava flowing through town are buried in some libraries somewhere. And while they're nice and exotic and interesting to look at, nobody will ever see them. But that's not true. You can go to museums and see paintings of the lava flow through Torre del Greco uh, in a very impressive colors. So what did the folks in Torre del Greco do when their historical center was buried under 33 foot of lava in 1794? They rebuilt on top of it. And in fact, that was the third time that they rebuilt on top of the lava flow. And uh, that's probably going to be a fourth time at some point in the future. Now, volcano is not just lava and pyroclastic flow, but there's also rocks being ejected at great distances that come crashing down like bombs. There's all kinds of things going on. So the folks in, in uh, Naples are not stupid. They know that's a volcano. So they created a red zone around the volcano and they say, this is the red zone. And what's going to happen in the red zone? Well. In the Vesuvius red zone, a little bit more than half a million people live there. And if the volcano is about to erupt, they will have to be evacuated. So they have a plan. It will take a week to accomplish it. They will rely on 500 buses, 220 train, and a truly optimistic outlook on Italian punctuality. And of course, they also need to be able to predict very well a week in advance when the eruption will occur, which is far from an exact science. Now. Of those people living in the red zone, 97% are aware that this is a zone of high volcanic risk. So they know it. But 61% only think it makes it a hostile place to live and recognize that they could be displaced by future eruption. So it's happened in the past, probably it's not gonna happen to us. Uh, in fact, uh, the government has offered 30,000 euro to anybody who's willing to abandon their home and move out of the red zone. And very few people have taken on the offer. And when people took on the offer, squatters moved in when the homes were left empty to reoccupy them. So technically the population in the red zone has not changed at all. Now let's change gear and talk about meet the little pigs. Uh, earthquakes by themselves are harmless. Uh, if you tell me, well, maybe short of tsunamis and, and uh, landslides. So if you tell me that there's going to be a magnitude 8 earthquake that's going to happen in one minute, I'm in the middle of an open field, I will pull the lawn chair, I will bring a martini, it'll be shaken, not stirred, it'll be perfect, I'll enjoy the ride, nothing else will happen. So it is the infrastructure that we build to protect ourselves from mother, mother nature, essentially, that collapse on us and kills us during an earthquake. And that's also the case for many other types of disasters. So that's the part where it gets interesting. And each one of these topics is by itself, you know, uh, multiple webinars, uh, just the, the way the brain is hardwired. I mean, we, we talk about willpower strain, misperception, irrationality, confirmation bias, prejudice, the manana syndrome, redemption buyout, scapegoating, very fun stuff. But in the limited time today, I think I'm going to focus on our relationship with probabilities and the role of building codes. So this is a sketch I, I replicated uh, of a statistician drowning in a river that is on average only two foot deep. We think of statistics in terms of averages. We're good with batting averages. But extreme events are tail risk. They're extreme, uh, low probability, high consequence event. And we're not even good with dealing with regular probabilities. So think about extreme events. It's, it's something that's not instinctively well uh, connected to us. So let's play a couple of games here. Uh, the first probability game we'll play is the following. This is a real case study that happened in the past. A group of 160 gynecologists was asked how many women who test positive from the results of a routine mammography actually truly have breast cancer if 1% of all the women have breast cancer, 90% of the women with breast cancer test positive, and 9% of the women who do not have breast cancer receive a false positive, like a false alarm. So let's check our abilities to do statistics. I will give you a minute to calculate that.
Okay, time flies fast, right? Full disclosure, it took me a lot more than a minute to figure it out. But if your answer is correct, we'll check it out here. So let's take a, a, a sample uh, of a, a thousand women. The first line says 1% have cancer. The second line says 90% have uh, will test positive. So that will give us nine positive. Of those who have no cancer, the third line tells us 9% will have a false positive. So that gives us 89 false positive. We do the little equation at the bottom and the correct answer is 9%. Okay, now don't feel bad if you did not get the answer correct because only 21% of the gynecologists, who by the way have more than 20 years of schooling, picked the right answer. I could have asked a question to kindergarten kids and by the laws of statistics, they would have randomly picked any one of the four and they would have had a 25% chance of picking the right answer, meaning kindergarten kids would have outranked the gynecologist on that question. That's our relationship with probabilities. Now let's be a little bit more technical, something more related to disasters. Here's the, the second uh, question. If you have the choice of building two absolutely identical houses for the exact same cost at the exact same location, which of the following two would you prefer to build? A house that is designed to resist earthquakes, except that over a period of 50 years, there's a 2% chance that an earthquake bigger than what has been considered in its design will occur. Or B, a house that is designed to resist earthquakes, except that an earthquake larger than what has been considered in its design will occur on average once every 2,500 years. This is a trick question because it makes no difference. These are just two different ways to express the exact same probability of exceedance, but we seem to connect differently with different ways that the question is posed or that the answer is presented. And of course, those who try to sell you stuff in the publicity world all study how we react to various expressions of probabilities, and they, 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 they mastered that very well. So there's another problem that comes along. Since we don't get probabilities, we tend to deny the risk. So in 1990, someone told me, uh, earthquake engineering, you're trying to sell something nobody cares about. And it's funny because uh, just last year during the opening ceremony of the 12th National Conference on Earthquake Engineering in Salt Lake City, the governor of Utah was in invited to give the opening remarks. And he said, nobody cares about the work you do until an earthquake happens. And then they do care. So it's the same thing. And it's true for any hazard. Resilience of the engineered infrastructure is something many don't care about of course, until after the disaster when they all care about it very much. So denial of risk is very tricky because it gives us an optimic, optimistic outlook on everything. Uh, changing hazard completely here, talking about hurricanes. Uh, I happen to know a lot of folks in Northeastern Florida around the Jacksonville area, all the way down to Daytona Beach. And they were all saying for various reasons, this is a great place to live in Florida because there's never any hurricane. It, it cannot happen here, period. And they have the strangest theories for that. I mean, some of the, the shape of the ocean floor, the fact that Cape Canaveral creates a wall that stops hurricane, uh, which of course, none of that is true, until Hurricane Matthew came along. When Hurricane Matthew was projected to hit the coast of Florida, he would have hit about right around West Palm Beach as a category four and would have hugged the coast all the way out, all the way out to South Carolina. That, that would have been the most expensive disaster in US history by an order of magnitude. Uh, fortunately, at the last minute, it steered offshore. So the high winds were av avoided completely. Uh, what was not avoided is storm surge. Now the, the wind pushes, you know, the circulation pushes the, the, the water towards the coast. If you're at low tide, you get a high tide. If you're at high tide, you get two high tides, which is what happened in this community that saw its beach disappear and saw parts of the road along the beach disappear as well. Now, how could anybody in their right mind anywhere in Florida think that they're free from hurricanes, that it can't happen there? This is a map that was made after Hurricane Charlie, and there's been many since, of only the category three and higher hurricanes in Florida. And I think I'm hard pressed to say there's a part in there that is safer than the other. It does not happen. It's just a fact that there's not enough of a long track record uh, to say that uh, you know uh, we've seen them all. Now, this is a picture I took in that community that was inundated at high tide by an extra high tide, that is the storm surge. Uh, this is a picture I took this year on the same street. The street has a base flood elevation of six foot, which is the asphalt essentially in front of the house. 
The one on the right is closer to the beach, by the way, than the one on the left. And this is the level of the base flood elevation. And this is the level where Hurricane Matthew flooded the street in 2016. So obviously the neighbor on the right has not chatted with the neighbors. Uh, you know, oh, you, did, did you get water all the way to your kitchen counters, by the way, in 2016? Obviously he didn't, didn't ask or she didn't ask. Now, trick question number three, how much water in the living room of a house built at base flood elevation level, if this is the base flood elevation level is minus six feet, will you get every hundred year? Now, this is not in Florida, by the way. Minus six feet, uh, if you think of the United States, where would that be? This is a map of the zoning for flood in minus six feet in New Orleans. And um, so they're behind levees. And therefore, this is what happened, of course, after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And so the answer to that question is, is six feet plus the amount by which the levees are overtopped. Uh, Post-Katrina, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers spent $14 billion to strengthen the levees and the walls that surrounded New Orleans to provide protection against a 100-year flood. So they recreated the levees to the same level of protection, a 100-year flood. That, left, they mean that, that means it leaves a 1% chance every year that all that work will not be sufficient to prevent flooding. After its completion of that work in 2018, uh, a year later, the U.S. Army Corps predicted that as a result of subsidence and sea level rise, the level of protection that this $14 billion investment provided would actually fall below the 100-year flood level by this year. Um, now, thinking, talking about hurricanes, uh, you may remember Hurricane Ian from last year, Category 4, that intersected and crossed uh, Florida near uh, Fort Myers Beach. Uh, something caught my eyes, what my, my eyes when I was uh, looking at pictures of the damage. The media always like to show destruction, destruction, destruction. That's that's you know, good clicks for the news. But I was looking at this house here on the coast and says, I want to know more about that house. This one stood up. I'm more interested by the success stories than by the failure stories sometimes. So I went on Lincoln the day after the hurricane. I said, this house I want to know more about. To my surprise, within five days, uh, totally unexpectedly, a million impressions, 7,000 likes, 500 comments. I could not even read all the comments, but I could separate the, the, the comments in two categories. The most common responses from those who identified themselves as engineers or contractors or folks in the construction industry was, this was good design, attention to structural details, breakaway walls for the storm surge, uh, floor above the base flood elevation level, uh, latest building code provisions, all the good stuff that engineers think about. And those who were not from the construction industry said, this is luck. This is whims of mother nature. This is probably a house that only the very rich people could afford. Uh, or some even said, this is an older home because in the good old days, we knew how to build. So there's all kinds of uh, answers all over the place. So I decided to investigate a little bit more. So I went to the real estate uh, websites the tax assessor's records, which are public, to pull out the year of construction of all those homes at the top of the picture here that you can see. And sure enough, the only one that is left standing there at the, the coast is built after year 2000, where all the others were older vintage construction. But that did not convince people. There were still a lot of folks who thought, oh, that's not right. Look, this, this, this must be on the ridge here because that house is all also behind it. There's lots of homes that are fine. But no, you have to think about storm surges like waves crashing and crashing. And so they destroy the first house, they move eventually down to the second house and they eventually move down to the third house. If you have a house that is well built and protects the houses behind it, they don't get to see all the waves crashing on them. There's no ridges in Florida, by the way, it's as flat as you can get in Florida. So uh, that's the explanation there. But some folks were still not convinced. Said, well, look at the pictures. This is not the same vintage of construction compared to 2020. They are still not convinced. So I continued to receive similar comments that were in these two categories. So I decided to reverse the angle, look at the homes from the ocean inland, uh, and then uh, only look at the coast. And the house that I was showing was here. But now looking at the coast, I see, you can see many more that survived. And I did the same thing, pulled out the year of construction for all these homes. And the ones that are survivors are post 2000. And all the ones where you only see a concrete flat, a concrete slab buried under debris were older vintage construction, obviously. And for those who said that these must be only the homes that the very rich can afford, 
the, the most expensive home in that lot is actually one that collapsed and it was worth $10 million. $10 million. And it was an older vintage home and it's gone. So uh, some cheaper than that survived and, and some more expensive collapsed. So when I hear this comment that, oh, it costs too much to, to do protection against hazard, I says, well, compared to what? I mean, this is this is the median value of homes, inflation adjusted value to 2020, year 2020. And you can see the bar chart going up, of course. The median home values has increased in the United States over the past 70 years. But at the same time, the line that I've plotted is the average house size. There's a direct correlation between the size of the home and the price of the home. Uh, so it's not the fact that you're putting smoke detectors in a home that makes it more expensive or the fact that it's going to be elevated. It's, it's all of these other things. The size matters. Now, building codes, as I've shown in the previous slides, building codes, yes, they do help. But first of all, the building codes must exist. Some cities and some states in the United States have been keen in the adopting codes, and some have resisted doing so for a number of different reasons. So there's some cities where they have no building codes as we speak. Second, uh, the purpose of the building code is not always what people think it is. So to illustrate that second bullet, let's talk about Christchurch. I said I would come back to Christchurch. I wanna talk about the magnitude 6.3 earthquake that is smaller than the bigger one that occurred to the left um, a, day, a year earlier, the small one was very close to the central business district, CBD. The yellow box here, that is this central business district. So let's do an experiment. Pick a building in, in this picture, any building you want. Keep your eyes on it. This is two weeks before the earthquake. And this is three days after the earthquake. So if I go back and forth between the two, chances are the building you selected is still there. The angle of the picture may have changed, the cloud cover may have changed, but that building is probably still there unless you pick the two that collapsed. These were two older vintage buildings uh, and they collapsed and most of the casualties occurred there. Or uh, if you picked buildings that suffered lots of damage from an aerial photograph, you may not be able to notice the damage because it's internal to the building. For example, the Grand Chancellor Hotel was leaning precariously towards the street because of damage on its first floor shear walls, had to be demolished, big endeavor. The four-side four bar building on the right, lost on the left, lost its staircases over 13 stories, leaving it to Kiwi ingenuity to find ways to get out of the building. Now let's do a different kind of experiment. Instead of looking at the individual building, take a global view in the center of the picture there of the central business district. We're gonna move from three days after the earthquake to 14 months afterwards. Now, big change, big change. Christchurch has been turned into a parking lot, giant parking lot. Great if you look for space for parking, but there's nothing to do in Christchurch anymore. It's a ghost town. And this is not because more aftershocks came and demolished buildings. No, this is because buildings were damaged. They were deemed too expensive to repair demolished by human activity, and eventually have been rebuilt over the past uh, decade or so, progressively. It's been a long, long process. And the problem is the following. Uh, we in earthquake engineering often explain that we design buildings with a, the same way we design a car. It's like this, the car crash analogy. If in a car crash, you try to create a structural system such that there will be damage, but the safety of the occupants will be achieved, and you'll be able to leave the car alive. Um, when you tell to owner you do earthquake resistant design and they think of the car analogy, they think of the picture on the right. They says, oh, we'll be fine. You can go through traffic, don't worry about it. The problem with the analogy, of course, is it's great that building codes are designed to achieve life safety, just like the car analogy does. But in an earthquake, everybody gets into the same car accident at the same time, hence Christchurch. So now you have this, all these buildings are essentially assets lost for the uh, life safety is achieved. So when you talk to the engineers, we talked to the engineers after uh, the Christchurch earthquake and we asked them, uh, what do you think of the performance of all these buildings, except for the two that collapsed, which were older vintage. And they say, well, that's great. Life safety was achieved. Everybody in the buildings, they all were able to escape peacefully, slowly, alive. They walked out, so mission accomplished. It's a great success story. Uh, when you talk to the population of Christchurch, who saw more than a thousand buildings being demolished in the central business district, they don't really think of it as a success story the same way. So what we also saw after the earthquake is that the priority shifted. 
things that were not even on the radar before the earthquake, business continuity, repairability, as part of the reconstruction process became very important to the tenants, to the developers, to the architects, to the engineer. So the earthquake created a huge shift in momentum from doing things the same way as we were doing before because we understand how much things will cost and we understand the process and the contractors are all set up to do it to a reshuffling of the deck to do new things. And the one thing we saw is that, that this, there's a change in the type of structural systems that happened. This is the picture I said I would come back to earlier. This is a structural steel frame that is designed to suffer damage and yield and dissipate the earthquake energy exactly where I'm pointing with my finger right now. So it has to be repaired. And the way it was repaired is that as you, if you pay close attention, you will see some welding lines on the beams and some welding lines on the braces. So they essentially cut out a chunk of the steel, fabricated one in the shop, brought the new piece in and re-welded it in place. And it was fast and it was quick and the buildings did not need to be demolished like the reinforced concrete buildings had to be. Before the earthquake, Christchurch was pretty much a reinforced concrete building town. Every new building, with very few exceptions, were built of reinforced concrete. That makes sense because the University of Canterbury was the, the, how, the home of Park and Pauli and Priestley, who essentially in, invented the techniques on how to design earthquake-resistant reinforced concrete buildings by dissipating energy and suffering damage and all that stuff. But the part that was not good is that after the damage was um, suffered, it's actually pretty exp expensive to repair that damage. So when we looked at the reconstruction of Christchurch over the period of 10 years that followed, and it's still happening, by the way, uh, the entire engineering community shifted completely on the type of structural systems that were being used. Christchurch became a steel town. And so there's a whole report we wrote. Uh, we talked to all of the engineers, well, you know, 10 engineering offices who were in charge of 73 buildings at the time that were being rebuilt in the downtown uh, district. And there's very few lawyers per square miles in New Zealand compared to the United States. So they were very candid in telling us the whole story as to why they picked certain type of structural systems for specific buildings. And so we were able to document that and that sort of is maybe more structural engineering than social science, but it's it's interesting to see the shift in momentum that the earthquake created and how it affected uh, construction, even though there was no major change in the building code at the time after the earthquake done. So it's just happening by the uh, drive of the system. So the third part of the book is Meet the Future. Uh, I mean, I read that already, but I think it's not part of today's presentation. Uh, I was denied the 45 hours, so it's 45 minutes. But I also, it doesn't quite make sense to talk about that part without having read all the details of the first two parts, which really enjoyed the third part. So I'll leave that to your full enjoyment coming up as you read the book. Uh, the book has been well received so far by the uh, general public. I think uh, Publishers Weekly was very positive. Uh, one website called it one of the top 10 book of 2022, which was well, all nice and great. But the surprise to me was that the engineering community really liked it. Uh, there's been positive reviews in Engineering News Record, American Society of Civil Engineering, uh, the UK Structural Engineering Society, Canadians as well. And so uh, I thought this was great, but it made me think, why, why are they so, so excited about it? And, and then it makes sense because, well, engineers are people too. <laughs> so uh, they can read the book like everybody else and enjoy it, but they have a little extra twist. They can read between the lines and say, oh, I, I see where this is going, right? So they have an extra enjoyment, I would think, which is probably why I think also social scientists are people too. <laughs> and they can also, see, they seem to have enjoyed it too, reading between the lines as well. So there's been a really nice reception uh, in, in a number of journals of public works and policy and, and things like that. So I'm grateful for that. But when I think of this, uh, let's assume that the engineers and the social scientists, they buy a gazillion copies of the book and the public buys zero. Uh, well, I would be grateful for the gazillion copies, thank you very much, but I would be calling it a disaster because the public has not read it. And that was the intent of the book, to reach the general public. So it made me think that the book is actually a tool to build bridges. And I, I sort of have a long version of it in an article I published in Structures Magazine, but the short, uh, the, the Reader's Digest version is, is three bullets. How do we enhance resilience of infrastructure? First step is silent heroes. 
uh, they're, they're folks like you, they're folks like everybody's working on building codes, working with policy, working behind the scenes of not seen by the general public, but they're moving the needle one nudge at a time. They're, they're moving forward and we're getting improvements done, but it takes a long time. The second way we do it is a disaster strikes. We have a, a lot of things to fix and it opens up windows of opportunity to do things differently. And people are suddenly very receptive to change and it can happen fast, but it's painful. Hell, it's painful. <laughs> The third way, maybe, is to use the book as a tool. Every time you share it with somebody who's not an expert in this field, you create a bridge. And these are little, all kinds of little bridges to inform the public on the exposure to hazards and the, to, to, to disasters that are possible and can introduce range of possible solutions on how to make things better. And that's important because a knowledgeable public, as I said earlier, is a necessary condition to achieve a resilient society. And this is definitely not a subliminal message. <laughs> so, uh, so I said I would go through selected bits from the whole story. We've covered these bits and pieces. So in closing, I would like to uh, reemphasize that the goal in writing The Blessings of Disaster was to provide a truthful but effective journey through the world of disaster and to make it enjoyable. And incidentally, today I've given you examples of the, the concepts that are mentioned in the book but they're not all examples in the book. I mean, it's the Hurricane Ian happened, happened afterwards, uh, things like that. And so think of it as, you know, in the old days when we had DVDs, there was the bonus features. So what you've had today was the bonus features <laughs> of things related to the DVD. Uh, so to make it uh, enjoyable to the general public, uh, I think to me was very important because I don't think you can connect otherwise. I mean, I don't like reading dry, boring books. And so why would I write a dry, boring book and try to convince people they should read it? So that's why as you go through this journey, uh, you'll discover connections between natural disasters and crooks and cows and hijackers. And we've talked about the three little pigs and nuclear holocaust and movie reviews and viruses, scapegoats, trading stamp, real estate agents, Chinese hockey sticks, airport proctologists, and many more. So we, we have to illustrate and make it uh, enjoyable to to uh, appreciate the issues. And in closing, I, if I come back to the original question that says, are we doomed? Now I think that you, uh, you will agree that without any hesitation, the answer is an absolute, confident and unwavering, it depends. And it depends on what? It depends on us, it depends on you, it depends on what we will do. Uh, because our response to existential threats depend on whether we learn from or ignore the lessons from past disasters. And I've put here, uh, couple of links uh, to my website, which is a bit out of date, probably four or five months, I probably have to update it. And uh, to the LinkedIn, uh, if you're interested to see posts every now and then that I make following uh, events. And uh, again, the not so subtle uh, subliminal message. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that very thought-provoking and very entertaining uh, presentation. Definitely not boring at all. So I think you met your goal. <laughs> um, so I, we do have some questions and comments coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and start reading those to you. So hopefully we can answer a couple of them at least before our time's up today. Um, so first, we have a question from Andrew Mish. Um, and he says, concerning the New Orleans example, at what point do planners suggest abandoning the place altogether? Oh, that's a very good question. It makes me think of uh, uh, you read sometimes um, uh, on on articles about um, climate change. Uh, some houses are built along the beach, right? And they say we should retreat. And anyway, it's a great idea in principle, right? The beach will be eroded, so just retreat. Now go to a homeowner who's along the beach and say, now you have to retreat. They will not move. They will not budge. Why? Because uh, every risk comes with rewards. Or I would say they're, they're willing to take risk for rewards, right? So you, everybody will make decisions in life on doing things if they think the rewards are worth it. So you go skiing, you know, it's a little bit dangerous, but the rewards is you truly enjoy going down the slopes. So that's great. So you build your home on the beach. You know that uh, if you know that it's going to erode, uh, are you really going to leave? So I've seen homes, and I think I've got some pictures in the book, which I, I use, I call them uh, formerly waterfront homes, which are now waterfront, water back, and water side homes. Uh, they're essentially surrounded by home uh, by water at high tide. They just are going to lose it eventually. And they're probably going to lose it before they retreat. <laughs> so, so they're enjoying the place. Um, it's very, I think, very hard to move people out of an area they enjoy. Uh, I think my example with uh, uh, Naples, 
uh, is exactly that. I mean, they can't move people away from the volcano. Uh, on the slopes of the volcano, the land is cheap. The view is great. Uh, they will build, uh, you know, retirement homes, resorts, hotels, restaurants. Um, so we are attracted to regions where the hazards exist. Uh, you will not vacate New Orleans easily, nor will you vacate California, right? So, <laughs> so we we have hazards, and we're going to be facing them at some point. How we face them and how we deal with them is the tricky part. And I think. If you look at hurricanes, um, I, the comparison I've made between homes there is, is critical because the new homes, the base flood elevation level, waterfront, is 17 feet. So it means your first livable floor has to be 17 feet above the ground. That's not going to stop erosion. Eventually, these homes will probably be underwater. But at least it's a good, it's a good start. And if somebody is retiring in, Cal in, in Florida... And they say, oh, you know, I'm 70 years old. I probably have 25 years to live. They probably don't mind that 100 years from now that that house will be gone. So it's all about a balance of risk and reward, which is very interesting. Thank you, Michelle. I think we have time for one more question, maybe before I turn it over to closing comments. Um, and this one comes from Brendan McCluskey. And he says, much of the presentation seemed to be on single family housing and commercial or business structures. What thoughts do you have on apartment buildings and other multifamily housing? Uh, I think the same thoughts that I have on, on the any kind of building, engineered building, which is what you've seen in Christchurch, I think. Uh, a lot of my research over the past 30 years has been to create more resilient structural systems. Uh, so I've got, I've got a couple of presentations. You probably can find these webinars online as well on, on resilience. And uh, the key to resilience is to not only be able to recover fast, which is part of the resilience definition, but to minimize the amount of uh, damage you suffer in the first place, which will make you recover faster. So if you think of the New Zealand example that I gave with the steel structure, uh, all the steel structures that were damaged in Christchurch, and they were very few of them, but there was about massive buildings too. I think the tallest building was a steel structure. Uh, they were returned to service very fast. And uh, the population saw that, that these are engineered buildings. They, they could be, you know, you could have the same thing with multi-story condominiums, right? It's just, this one was a hotel, this one is a parking garage, but you have all kinds. And uh, that's the key, I think. It's, it's to engineer things for resilience. So without going into much detail here, I think I've worked in the past 30 years at creating more than half a dozen structural systems that will help you achieve this resilience objective of minimizing damage and accelerating return to service. And that's a good step in that direction. Of course, there's another point where I've, you can push it to full functionality. And there's a system we've just developed recently for bridges where the bridges will remain open following the earthquake. They can absorb the earthquake shock without any damage without any need for repair. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's, I, I gave example res residential homes, of course, but I'm an engineer, so that, um, don't, <laughs> don't be misguided by that. Everything I've done in the past decades has been for engineered st structural systems. Thank you so much. That was such a great presentation. Um, so let me just move to my notes here. I have my screen. Okay, so in, in addition to thanking you for this wonderful presentation, uh, we would also like to thank the many other contributors uh, to this outstanding effort. We want to again thank FEMA and the National Science Foundation for making this webinar series possible. We are also grateful for all of the attendees who joined us today. Um, and before we close, just a few announcements. First, be, uh, please remember to contact us at hazctr at colorado.edu if you plan to request the continuing education credit generously offered through IAEM. And... Okay, and we hope that uh, you will save the date for our next Making Mitigation Work webinar, which is on Tuesday, November 14th, uh, 2023, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Mountain Time. We also hope you will subscribe to updates to the Natural Hazards Center website so you will receive notifications about our upcoming webinars as well as other free resources and information, including um, information about the Natural Hazards Workshop, which is held every year in July. Um, and now on behalf of the entire team at the Natural Hazards Center, I just want to say thank you again, uh, Michelle, for this presentation, as well as all the participants who joined us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in November.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for, for your time today.